Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome Alistair Donaldson again to MSR. Alistair is a, a professor. Uh, I don't know if that, that's not the title, actually. Lecture. It's a lecturer, yeah. lecturer in the Department of Computing uh, at Imperial College London. Um, he, um, after, um, uh, after, um, he, after, after doing his postdoc at Oxford University, he uh, spent a few months as a visiting researcher at Microsoft. And he started the project uh, called GPU Verify for uh, verification of uh, GPU kernels uh, back at that time in collaboration with people here. And since then, he has made a lot of progress on that project uh, along with colleagues at Imperial. And he's going to tell us about some of that work today. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thanks, Chaz. So given that it's such a small audience, let's make it really informal. And I just tell you a bit about what we've been doing. And please ask okay. as many questions. And yeah, we, can, we don't have to get through the whole deck of slides if you have more questions. Hi, Ken. So this is joint work with Shaz, uh, initially just Shaz, when we were collaborators here at Microsoft. And then since then, I've recruited various PhD students and postdocs, none of whom have GPU Verify as their principal thing, but all of whom have done something, some hacking on it. So there's this long list of contributors. And the project is supported by the, the CARP project, which is, a, which is an EU-funded project um, on correct and efficient accelerator programming, which I'm coordinating at Imperial. And the project's kind of split between optimizations performance optimizations and correctness checking, and we're focusing on the correctness checking side of things. So these are the guys who contributed to the, the project. I have three, three postdocs, Jeroen, Adam, who's a bit shy, as you can see, and John, and then some PhD students, Paul and Nathan, uh, who've worked a lot on the project, and Dan, who just started recently, and a, a new student, Pantazis, who's starting in July. And I'm actually looking for one more PhD student, so if you know any bright young candidates who would like to live in London, please send them my way. And generally, the, the aim of the research in our group, the multi-core programming group, is to design automated techniques to help people um, write correct and efficient parallel software. So I'm particularly interested in concurrent programming, partly because I think it's cool to try to get things to go faster, but partly because of the correctness challenges it raises. And actually, I think that from a correctness and verification point of view, I think it's very hard to, to verify general properties of arbitrary sequential programs. But I think if you take a parallel program and you look for things like data races or deadlock freedom, they can be easier, perhaps, to give people useful tools uh, to help them with rather than trying to try to look, look at the verification of more general properties. OK, so I'm going to tell you about our work on verification of GPU kernels, which I think is an application of the idea that's becoming quite popular these days of trying to analyze concurrent programs by somehow converting the problem to a sequential program analysis task. So first of all, let me tell you a bit about what a, a GPU is. A GPU is a graphics processing unit. And I'm going to give a schematic overview of what a typical GPU looks like. Nothing that I say here is going to be completely true of all GPUs. So if you know about GPUs, then you uh, you know that it's not strictly true. But a GPU generally consists of a number of processing elements, which you might like to think of as cores, although they're typically a bit simpler than CPU cores. And every processing element has a small amount of memory that it has exclusive access to. Then there are an, a number of these processing elements on the GPU. And the processing elements are arranged into groups, such that every group has a portion of memory that's shared am, among all the processing elements in the group. So these guys can communicate with each other through this group shared memory, but they can't communicate with those guys through each other's group shared memory. And then in addition, there's a pool of global memory, which all the processing elements can share. And to some extent, processing elements in different groups can communicate through this global memory. However, in typical GPU designs, there is a mechanism for processing elements in the same group to synchronize with one another, but no mechanism for processing elements in different groups to synchronize with one another. So this global memory is not really used for inter-processing element communication. It's more used to actually get data from the host device and give data back to the host device. Make sense? I have one question. Actually. Yeah. Uh, do uh, GPUs typically provide interlock interlocked operations? Like, su you, such as? Like uh, compare and swap, those kinds of things? Well, yeah, they do, yeah. They do. And that's actually something which we want to look at next in our work. That's quite challenging from a verification perspective. But w the one problem is that there's not really a consensus among which operations the various families of GPUs provide. But the OpenCL spec, for instance, has a bunch of atomic operations that it specifies. 
Okay, so a GPU accelerated system would typically consist of a host computer, like a multi-core PC. Here I'm showing you maybe an eight-core PC, and a plug-in card. And what happens is the host is responsible for copying both data and code into the global memory of the GPU. And the code is a function called a kernel function. And this has nothing to do with OS kernels. I sometimes get people asking me questions about that. So it's a completely different meaning of the word kernel, or the same ultimate meaning, but a different specific meaning. And the host then says to the, the GPU, go, invoke the kernel. And what this does is it lights up all of these processing elements. And what they do is they copy data from global memory into group shared memory, from group shared memory into private memory. They crunch through it, eventually copy it back to global memory. And when they're done, the, the host is interrupted and it can copy back the results for further processing. So in a typical GPU accelerated application, you might just have some preparation code on the host one kernel invocation and then some processing code, or you might have a sequence of kernels in a pipeline, or you might have something like um, a loop with a kernel invocation inside it. If you're doing an iterative algorithm where you have a number of time steps, a common thing would be to have a, a timing loop on the host, and then for every time step you do some calculation and then do it again and again and again. Okay. So, a uh, serious problem when programming GPUs is the problem of data races, which are well known from regular concurrent programming. So a data race occurs when we have got two processing elements or threads running on two processing elements in the same group that access a location in group shared memory. And at least one of these accesses is a write. And this is called an intragroup data race. And we can also have an intergroup data race where we have threads running on processing elements in different groups and they um, access a global memory location and at least one access is a write and there's no synchronization operation separating them. This is an intergroup data race and we can also have an intragroup data race on global memory which I'm not showing you in this diagram. So data races lead to all kinds of problems and I think something that's interesting in the GPU context, so I think um, it's very well known that the problems that data races bring, problems of non-determinism mainly, but in GPU kernels there's I think a worse problem, which is that actually you may have device determinism. So on a particular GPU architecture, GPUs, if you know a bit about how they work, you'll know that they're kind of deterministic. So actually threads don't get scheduled by an OS and you don't have preemptions and that kind of thing. Threads get scheduled by a driver and they get scheduled in a very deterministic way on a given GPU. So it may well be that you've got a kernel that could exhibit a race but never does on NVIDIA architecture X. And then if you, you port that kernel to another architecture, you may uh, then discover there's a problem. And, it, and uh, there are programming models such as OpenCL, which aim to be portable so that actually kernels get compiled at runtime for whatever architecture is available. So in that setting, you don't necessarily know what your customers are going to be running your kernel on. So uh, if you've tested on a variety of architectures and discovered no data races, it may be that you, you cannot discover data races by testing alone. And yet, on some architectures, there would be data races. So, and another thing to point out is that data races in GPU kernels are almost always accidental and unwanted. So we don't have the, the case in systems code where there are deliberate benign data races. What I've seen are benign data races where, for instance, many threads write the same value to a location. That, that happens. You sometimes have data races where, for strange but actually good reasons, a thread is going to write something, but it's guaranteed to write what's already there. And another thread might be reading, in which case that doesn't matter. Um, but I haven't seen examples where we have got, for instance, synchronization primitives being implemented by busy wait loops in GPU kernels. That's not something that would be very efficient, and it's not something that would be portable across architectures either. So what we've been uh, doing in our work is looking at data race analysis for GPU kernels. But let me tell you, uh, first of all, how you would avoid data races in a GPU kernel, and also show you an example kernel. So this is a little kernel written in the OpenCL language. We have a, a regular C function which we prefix with the keyword kernel to say that this is a, an entry point to the kernel. This is where threads commence execution. And the kernel is going to declare that it takes an array of integers as an argument and that this array, the contents are going to reside in local memory, which is in OpenCL what group shared memory is called. So local means group shared. And then also this kernel is going to take an int offset as another argument. And what the kernel is going to do is it's going to add um, every thread is going to write to its thread ID. And what it's going to write is the, what, what is already at its thread ID plus what's at its neighbor's thread ID. So it's going to write a tid plus a tid plus offset. OK, so spot the data race. I'll grab my coffee while you think. Well, 
mean everyone's running in parallel, right? Yeah. So, so everyone is uh, reading TID plus offset, but that's someone else's TID, right? So exactly, right. So if so offset was 1, for instance, and TID was uh, 0, then thread 0 would be writing to 0 and reading from 1, potentially in parallel with thread 1 writing to 1. So this would be a read-write data race. Okay. And we can avoid this data race by using a barrier. So we can, for instance, read a TID plus offset into a temporary variable. Then we can do our write um, using temp instead of a TID plus offset. And then we can have a barrier synchronization statement in between these statements. And what barrier says is that every thread running the kernel must get to the barrier before any thread leaves the barrier. And furthermore, that all loads and stores for memory will have completed before any thread leaves the barrier. Now, actually, like I mentioned briefly earlier, it's only possible for threads within the same group to synchronize with each other. So a barrier is a synchronization operation between threads in the same group. But for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to assume all threads are in the same group for explanation purposes, although in the tool uh, and theory, we deal with the general case. OK, any questions at this point about GPUs, kernels, and such like? Oh, yeah, so it stops the accesses from being concurrent. OK, so there's been a lot of interest over the last few years in verification and analysis for GPU kernels. The leaders in this area were the group of Ganesh Gopalakrishnan at the University of Utah, who have a tool called PUG for analyzing CUDA kernels, which was published at FSE a few years ago. And they're these days more focusing on a tool called GCLI, which uses dynamic symbolic execution. It's based on the CLI execution engine developed at Stanford and now at Imperial College. And an interesting thing they've done recently is extended the GCLI tool to handle atomic operations, which is a very nice piece of work. The University of Twente, who are collaborators on our CARP project, are looking at using separation logic with permissions to, to prove data race freedom of GPU kernels. The idea is that you have a, um, a permission logic, and you prove a kernel by showing that a thread can only write somewhere if it has write permission. So it's a, a, a nice application of, of separation logic. There's a nice paper from ESOP a couple of years ago about, about the SIMT model that's used for CUDA kernels. Um, and yeah, another partner in our CART project are looking at doing symbolic execution of GPU kernels. And finally, aside from our work, there was a paper about using test amplification at PLDI last year. The idea of this work is that you actually dynamically run a kernel and check for one trace whether there were data races. And then you use some static analysis to try to discover whether that trace was in any way influenced by inputs to the kernel. And if it wasn't, you can conclude that the kernel is free from data races. Question about that one. Do they yep. actually run the kernel, or do they have a simulator? I believe they did it with a simulator, because it's quite difficult with a, uh, it's very difficult to do logging on a GPU. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah, we published our work at Oopsla last year. That was the main paper about GPU Verify and a, a more technical paper about some of the recent developments in the tool at ESOP this year. So GPU Verify is a tool for, for verifying data race freedom, which I've described to you, and another property, barrier divergence freedom, which I'll talk about briefly later, for OpenCL and CUDA kernels. So CUDA is a GPU programming model from NVIDIA, who are the market leader in GPU devices. And OpenCL is a more general programming model that's been put together by the Kronos Group, a consortium consisting of a bunch of partners, including, I would say, pretty much every major player apart from Microsoft, I think <laughs> it's fair to say. And uh, so Microsoft have C++ AMP, which is uh, another accelerated massive parallelism, which is different again. And yeah, we decided to focus on both of these pro programming models because they're very similar. We'd rather just focus on OpenCL, I suppose, for simplicity, but CUDA is more widely used still. Hopefully, that won't be the case in a, in a year or so, but it is in the moment. So before I go into the details, I, I'm going to give you a demo of GPU Verify to give you a feeling of what it does. Please just interrupt me if you have any questions. So I'm going to write a, a little kernel to perform a reduction operation. What this is going to do is it's going to take an array of ints in local memory. And I am going to have every thread, um, I'm going to have the threads sum their neighbor's elements using doing a tree reduction. So a thread will sum a neighbor, if there are n threads, n over two places away, and then n over four places away, and then n over eight places away, and n over 16 places away. And every iteration of the reduction loop, half the threads will drop out of the computation. So this is a common thing to do in a, in a GPU kernel to, co um, to collate results. So I'm going to say for int d equals n over two, where n is the number of threads, while d is greater than zero, I'm going to divide d by 2. 
by shifting it right by one. I'm going to say um, if my ID is less than D, so if I'm still active, then A at my ID is incremented by A at my ID plus my neighbor D places away's ID. And I'm going to put in some defines here. So there's no TID actually in OpenCL. I'm going to define TID to be get local ID zero. This is a built-in function that gets a thread's local ID in the zeroth dimension. So these kernels could be multidimensional. I'm not going to go into the details of that here. Let's assume the kernels are one-dimensional. And n is going to be the number of threads in dimension zero. All right, so assuming I've not made any syntax errors, uh, this should, the tool should do something on this. So first of all, the tool will complain, and it will say that the work group size must be specified using local size. So what we're not trying to do in this work is parameterize verification. We're not trying to prove that these kernels are correct for any number of threads. That, of course, would be a nice thing to do. But kernels are not usually correct for any number of threads. They're usually cor correct for, say, every number of threads as a power of two, or every number of threads with some property. And second, the theorem provers that underlie our work don't deal very well with nonlinear arithmetic. And we very commonly do something like multiply a variable, by, a variable by the number of threads. So if the number of threads is a constant, that's OK. But if it's not a constant, that would be very hard to reason about. So GPU verify local size. So let's try it with 1,024 threads. And similarly, you have to say how many groups there are. I'm just going consider, to consider one group here. So the tool will think for a minute. Uh, I tend to find that when I first run a C-sharp application, it takes a while. Yeah. Okay. So it's reported a couple of possible data races. So it's saying that at kernel.cl, there is a possible read-write race uh, at, on the array A at byte offset 4. So we see A cast to a character pointer, and then byte offset 4. And this is line 9, column 25, by thread 0 of group 0 and line 9, column 15, a write by thread 1 of group 0. So if I go back to the example, then line column uh, 25, I think, is this read here, and column 15 is this write here. OK, and you can see that because I've not got any barrier synchronization, there's actually nothing to stop one thread skipping ahead to a further loop iteration and interfering with another thread in a previous loop iteration. So to eliminate this problem, I can put a barrier synchronization in here. So barrier, and then I give a flag to say this CLK local mem fence, this is a way of saying I want to do a barrier on local memory. So because this array is a local pointer, then uh, that's the right thing to do. OK? So does this look good? Yeah? Really? OK, so now what the tool is going to say is that one error. So uh, line 10, column 13, barrier may be reached by non-uniform control flow. So this barrier statement here made a deliberate error. And what I did was I enclosed the barrier statement inside this conditional, which means that some threads will reach the barrier, but not all threads. And this is illegal in the OpenCL programming model. If you have a barrier in conditional code, either all threads or no threads must reach the barrier. In other words, the condition guarding the barrier must be uniform. OK, so the tool has de detected barrier divergence here. When I say detected, I'm running the tool in verify mode, so it's not actually detecting anything. It's, it's not managing to prove the kernel. So we can run the tool in a bounded model checking mode where it will unwind the program. So if I fix this problem, then what we should see now is some success. So the tool will tell us that there are no data races within work groups, no data races between work groups, no barrier divergence, no assertion failures, because you can write um, your own assertions in, in GPU Verify. But of course, no warranty provided because this is a, a research prototype. Okay. Um, and I wonder if this is, so that's. It is intended to be signed, yeah. We're trying to do signed verification. But there are various ways in which we're not signed. For instance, we make the pragmatic assumption that the pointer parameters to a kernel point, it, point to disjoint arrays. That I actually have a feeling that that may be required in the spec. I should look that up. But even if it's not required, that's what people do. I mean, and if we didn't make that assumption, we would just report data traces everywhere. So that's one thing. We don't do bounds checking, so it's possible you could have a buffer followed by another buffer, and then, we could, and then you could overflow the bounds of that buffer and have a data race as a result, um, whereas we would see writes to different arrays, and we would say that they were race-free. So there are various ways in which you know, we're, we're sound uh, modulo a whole bunch of provisos. Yeah. OK. 
And yeah, we can write some, some assertions. So I might say here, assert is pow to d. And I could say, x is a power of 2. If x bitwise anded with x minus 1 equals 0, and x is not equal to 0. So a power of 2 is a binary number with one bit set. So you can test that by saying if, the, if you just subtract 1, you get all the lower bits set. And if you add them together, you should get 0. But 0 also satisfies that property. So and 0 is not a power of 2. OK, so now I could run GP verify on this. And uh, I, you might have noticed that I made a slight tweak to the kernel to make this not, not hold. Can you get a loop invariant? Um, Was there a loop there? There is a loop there, yeah. But we have to have loop invariants to do all that proof, right? Yeah. Yeah. OK, so assertion might not hold for thread 544 of group 0. And then you might think, hang on a minute, is that a problem specific to thread 544? So we could say here something like assume that TID is less than 10, for instance, which is just something you could do as a programmer to to rein in the verifier a bit. And now, OK, it's actually complaining now about thread 8. So it's using a constraint solver behind the scenes. And we've just told the constraint solver, I want you to find me a thread less than um, 10. Obviously, you have to be very careful, because if we do something stupid like that, then the kernel, of course, will become correct all of a sudden. OK, but anyway, what I wanted to show you was that now we could run the tool in bug finding mode, because as Shaz said, we need loop invariants to prove correctness of these kernels. And it may be that the kernel is correct, but we didn't find a loop invariant. Can you, do you have the capability to write a loop invariant at the C level? Yeah. C level, I mean? Uh -huh. okay. So I could say find bugs and then loop unwind equals four, for instance. And, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> OK, let's not do that. So, right, now if I said find bugs, and I have 10, 24 threads. How many threads is it, is it going to use? Did, did you specify in the command line how many threads to use in the bounded bound line? Uh, yeah, so, it, so I say 1,024 threads. But the tool actually is going to only ever consider two threads, okay. which I'll come to in a minute. And when I say, uh, and to make that sound, it uses some abstraction. So when I say find bugs, actually, it's going to be finding bugs, not employing any kind of loop invariant abstraction, but it will be employing some abstraction still. So these bugs could still be false positives due to that abstraction. Okay. But it will do, it's do some kind of context uh, bounding? Uh, no, it's not. Let me get onto that. That's the next part of the talk. So, yeah. OK, well, I, anyway, I would have been able to show you something's a bit wrong now. But I would have been able to show you that actually, because I said greater than or equal to 0, um, this really is a bug. And we'd find it if we unwound enough. And if we, um, but what I can show you is that if we just say greater than 0, then the tool should be able to verify this. Oh, man, something is seriously wrong. OK, I've been working on this, adding new features. So never do that before a talk. But since you said loop unwind, it was. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, it wouldn't have. But this, I've now fixed the bug. And yeah, so now it should be inductive, right? So yeah. No, but you have, you have to still supply the loop invariant, right? No, but it should get this. But that it should, should think be, of that as a loop invariant. That should be inductive, right? Because if you take a power of 2 and divide it by 2, it's either 0 or another power of 2, right? So, mm. so that should work. But yeah. Can you, can you get out the actual variable values when, when an induction fails? Uh, n so no, we, yes, in principle, because it just, yeah, yes, in principle, but no, not right now. Yeah. OK, I'm not going to try and debug this no. right now, but that's, that's kind of frustrating. because we, we know how this goes. Yeah. All right. So let me tell you now about the verification strategy behind the tool. So the first thing is, what, what, what we've been trying to do in this project is actually exploit the simplicity of the GPU programming model to come up with a very efficient verification method. So the first thing we exploit is the fact that data races always occur between a pair of barriers. So barrier one and barrier two. All right. So we have a barrier-free region of code. And we can have a race between statements of different threads in this region, but we can't have a data race between, say, a thread executing something up there and a thread executing something in there, because they can't be at these places um, separately. So this immediately makes the program analysis problem easier. We can restrict attention to barrier-free regions of code. This is something that the, the pug approach also exploits. OK, the next thing to observe, which is something that 
um, was kind of new to me, but I've since discovered is a fairly well-known thing, is that when you're doing data race analysis, you can often prune the number of schedules you consider if you're guaranteed to abort on a data race. So actually, between a pair of barriers A and B, we can pull the following trick. We can run thread zero all the way from A to B and log all of the accesses that it makes. Then run thread one all the way from A to B and log all its accesses and also check all of its accesses against those of thread zero. And if we find that there's a problem between these, we abort immediately. Otherwise, you run thread two all the way from A to B, log all of its accesses and check them against thread zero and one and abort if we find a race. And we keep doing this until we finally run the final thread from A to B. I guess we don't need to log all of its accesses, but we do need to check them against all, those of all the other threads and abort if we find a race. So the thing to observe here is that if you think about it, a data race always occurs between some pair of threads. So with this schedule, if there could be a data race between some pair of threads between these two barriers, then this schedule will find the race because of the logging and checking. And if there's no race, then actually this schedule will lead to precisely the same state here as any other schedule would have. If you think about it, you might think, well, that's not true because a different interleaving might have resulted in different interactions between the threads leading to a different state. But the threads can only interact by racing with each other. And if they race, we abort. Does anyone disbelieve that? Or want me to clarify it further? I think it's... So essentially, no one can, between barriers, no one can read anything that's been written by anyone Since else. the barrier, yeah. Right, so they have to be independent. Yeah, and we're, uh, 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 so it's that, exactly, except, that, well, they can, but in that case, we're going to abort. Well, yeah. right, so I mean, so you don't even have to know the order of reads and writes in the threads when you check the locks, right? You just have to say, did anyone read something? Yeah, that's right. We can record these as sets, not sequences. You're already dead if that, yeah. if that Okay, so it's so, a... Um, a pretty straightforward trick. And this immediately reduces us to the problem of sequential program verification now. We can rewrite a GPU kernel as a sequential program where we serialize the threads in this schedule or, in fact, any other schedule we, we choose. We could take a round robin schedule. Or, in particular, what it means is you have a very simple sequentialization. Yeah. As opposed to the rather more complex case if you allow the threads to interact. Yes, that's right. Yeah. OK, so this avoids reasoning about interleavings, which is good. But we can actually do better, and we can observe that data races occur between just pairs of threads. So what we could do is we can pick an arbitrary pair of threads, i and j, inside this um, region, sorry, inside the range of threads. And now we can consider barriers a and b, and we can consider running thread i from a to b and logging all of its accesses, and then running thread j from a to b and checking all of its accesses. Now, because i and j are arbitrary, and I'm not, by the way, talking about choosing a specific pair, like thread one and two, I'm talking about taking, considering every possible pair, if we can show for every possible pair that between these barriers they can't race, then there can be no race between any threads for the barrier region. All right. So in some feedback on our work, we've had comments that this is quite similar to ideas in protocol verification, where you pick a pair of, of processes and you make the uh, other processes abstract. But I think that there are similarities, but the key difference here is that we actually have to consider all of the pairs because these kernels are not symmetric. Even though the threads run the same program, they do not have to do the same thing. They can I follow a different control that flow. I and J are symbolic constants. Yeah, they're symbolic right? constants, that's so right. So yeah. the solver will consider all possible values. Right? Yeah, okay. exactly. So if a data race exists, then some choice of I and J will expose it. And if we can show for all I and J that, that this little program fragment is free from data races, then we know that there can be no data races if we did have all the threads executing. But on the other hand, if you don't, I mean, if you, if you have a data race, it can be a false one simply because you started in an unreachable state. Mm -hmm. that so that's the, yeah, if this was the beginning of the kernel and we had a precondition on the entry state, then up to the first barrier we could be precise. Right? But this brings me on to my next slide, which is, is this actually a sound thing to do at all? So say we had barrier A, barrier B, we pulled this trick of running thread I and then thread J and checking for races between them. And then we have barrier B to barrier C and we pull the same trick again. Well, if you think about it, this is not a sound thing to do because it would appear that the other threads just don't exist. We would see the world changing for these two threads. But then the point of a barrier synchronization is now we can see what the other threads did and we can safely read it. But if we don't model those other threads and we just continue, then we are, uh, you know, you might have an array that's all zeros and threads are going to set it to one. So it should be all ones after when we reach the barrier. We're going to see it be one in two places and carry on. And then the analysis is going to be nonsensical. So this is not sound on its own. To make it sound, we have to make the shared state it's somehow abstract to model possible effects of all the other threads. 
So there are two things we've explored here in our initial work and something more sophisticated recently. But the simplest idea is to make the shared state completely arbitrary. And there are two ways of doing that. One is you can havoc the shared state every time you reach a barrier. Uh, another thing you can do is you can actually just remove the shared state completely and treat all reads as non-deterministic reads. So if you read into a variable, you just havoc the variable. And when you write to the shared state, you simply you log where the write would have gone for race checking purposes, but you just remove the actual write statement. So we have both options. The second option has the advantage of, um, well, it uh, avoids the need to generate arrays for the theorem proof of the reason by which can, can lead to, more, to better efficiency. But it has some disadvantages as well, which I, which I won't go into right now, but I can tell you about them later if you're interested. All right, so the GPU verification strategy is to exploit the any schedule will do trick and the two threads will do trick with some abstraction to make the whole thing sound and also with predicated execution, which I will come to if I have time in a little while, to turn a massively parallel kernel K, so a program that we want to consider for thousands of threads potentially, into a sequential program P that is linear in the size of K, the text size of K, such that if P can be proven correct, by which I mean that no assertions can fail in P, and I mean partially correct here, not totally correct, then K is free from data races and barrier divergence. So this is the, the, um, the meta theory behind our approach. But if you're going to consider only two threads, then you don't really need predicated execution, right? Because you can just copy the kernel twice. Not if they step into procedures and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, I was yeah. forgetting about that. Yeah. There could be loops there exactly. also. Exactly, yeah. So we'll, I'll come on to predicate execution shortly, and we can describe things. How am I doing for time? I don't have a watch on me. Oh. Uh, oh, there. OK, cool. Right. OK, so let me tell you briefly about the, the tool chain architecture. What we do is we take an open cell or a CUDA kernel. And in future, we would like to consider C++ AMP kernels. But they're a bit more challenging, because C++ AMP has this nice thing of being a single source solution, where you write a C++ program, and there is this special use of templates to describe that you want some um, piece of code to be accelerated, which is a, a bit like saying it should be a, run as a GPU kernel, although AMP is, in principle, more general yeah. than that. This makes it quite, quite difficult for an academic tool to parse. Okay, so the, these are easier targets. We use the Clang and LLVM compiler framework, in particular the Clang front end, to turn a kernel written in one of these programming models into a boogie program, a sequential boogie program. So we, what we actually do is we, we parse the kernel and turn it into one kind of boogie program. And then we do have this kernel transformation engine that applies all our tricks to produce a sequential program to be verified. And then we give this to the Boogie verification engine developed here at Microsoft Research. And Boogie uses an SMT solver, principally the Z3 SMT solver. Uh, although we're looking right now at support for the CVC4 solver as an alternative, which has a more in industry friendly license. And then for verification to work, we have to generate candidate loop invariants and procedure pre and post conditions. Although GPU kernels don't allow recursion currently, and they're not that big, the programs tend to be hundreds tens or hundreds or maybe a thousand lines of code rather than tens of thousands of lines of code. So we have not yet found a case where it's, it's we've, we find it's always better to do full inlining than to try to actually infer contracts. Sometimes we can infer contracts, but actually it's more expensive to do the inference than to just inline everything. And often the inference will fail. So really our effort has been on candidate loop invariants. And a good thing about this setup is that Clang is extremely widely used. I mean, it's being used by almost everybody these days. Boogie is very widely used in the verification community, and Z3, I suppose, is even more widely used because I would say that every verification tool at the moment seems to use Z3, and then I think there are a whole bunch of other users as well. So these things are being improved all the time. Other people fix bugs in them. And the only magic of our approach where we have to actually be really careful we don't introduce unsoundness is in this component here. So we can put all of our brain power into making this correct and rely on other things being as correct as can be expected from complicated bits of software. So yeah, the soundness of our approach is much easier to argue than it would be had we built some complete verifier for kernels where we actually did the verification condition generation in some smart way ourselves. OK, so now what I want to do is show you an example of how we take a, a kernel that doesn't have any loops or conditionals and do this two-threaded transformation. I'll go through this reasonably quickly because it's fairly straightforward. So this is an OpenCL kernel. And what we do is we generate a sequential program uh, I'm going to show you in C form here, although it would really be a boogie program, void foo. And we have a precondition. Uh, we introduce two symbolic constants, tid $1 and tid $2. 
and we have a precondition saying that they are in the range of thread IDs, they're between 0 and n, and that they're different from one another. So this is our way of considering two arbitrary distinct threads. We have these symbolic constants, tid dollar one and tid dollar two. And then what follows dollar one and dollar two are going to be used to indicate that the, the version of a variable for the first thread or the second thread. And just to be clear, I'm not talking, I'm very much not talking about threads one and two. I'm talking about the first and second of the two arbitrary threads under consideration. OK, what we do is we take the parameter idx and we say that, every, that each thread has its own copy of this parameter. And we had a precondition saying that these copies are initially equal because the kernel gets invoked with parameters being passed by value and every thread receives the same value for parameters. So the threads could, in principle, change these parameters later, which is why they need their own copy, but initially the, the values will be the same. And we, we just remove this array A because I'm going to show you this abstraction, which we call the adversarial abstraction, where the shared state just disappears completely. Then x becomes x for thread 1, x for thread 2. y becomes y for thread 1, y for thread 2. And now this read from a tid plus index into x, this turns into the following. First of all, we log that a read has occurred from a, and we log that thread 1 was the reader, just thread 1. We're not going to consider thread 2 reading, only thread 1. So tid dollar one plus idx dollar one, that's the offset for the read. And then we check that thread two reading from A at this offset is OK with respect to any prior reads or writes that have happened, which in this case would just be that read. OK, but this is the general trans translation. So we do logging for thread one and checking for thread two. And then to reflect the fact that x will be modified by reading from the shared state, we havoc x for both of the threads. So both threads are doing the read, but we're logging it for the first thread and checking it for the second thread. But we have to reflect the fact that the read happened for both of them, so we havoc both copies of x. And this models the fact that a could have been changing arbitrarily by other threads that may have even been having data races with each other. Then we do the same for y. So uh, log read, check read, havoc y. And then, slightly more interestingly, when we write into a at tid, we write the value x plus y, then what we do is we log a write by thread one at index tid dollar one, so at thread one's ID. Then we check a write at index tid dollar two for thread two. And then there's actually nothing more to do. So for the read case, we have to havoc the receiving variable. But for the write case, we don't have to do anything to reflect the effect of the write because we have actually removed the shared state completely. So it's like the write is disappearing into the void. And in return, reads um, anything that arrives. All right. So. Now let me explain briefly the race checking instrumentation we use. This is a bit of, a, of an implementation detail. We could have done something different here, but this we found to work very well. So for every array parameter, we introduce a bunch of global variables. We have a variable read has occurred for the array, which is a Boolean, and a variable write has occurred, which is a Boolean. And the idea is that this Boolean will be false if we are currently not considering any read being in flight for this array. And it will be true if we are considering some read. And then we introduce a variable read offset a and a variable write offset a, which are integers. So the idea is that if read has occurred is true, then read offset says the offset corresponding to the read. If read has occurred is false, then the value of read offset is irrelevant. So this allows us to track either zero reads or one read, but no more than that. Uh, does this make sense so far? And I'll show you how we're going to use it in a minute. And then we introduce four procedures, a procedure called log read A, which takes an offset, uh, log write A, which takes an offset, check read A, and check write A, each of which take an offset. And the idea is that the, the log procedures will be invoked with respect to the first thread and the check procedures with respect to the second thread. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider just the first thread logging and just the second thread checking. But because we're going to consider all possible pairs of threads, this is OK. So we're exploiting symmetry here. OK, and we get rid of the array parameter. Right, All right. So the idea is that log read is going to somehow be non-determinist. Yeah, OK, yeah, you're one step ahead. All right, so I think I've explained this. Yep, this is for a, an undergraduate summer school, so I'm stepping through a bit more slowly, but I think we can skip on. OK, so log read takes an in offset. And the maybe immediate thing you might think of would be to say, we say that a read has occurred, and it occurred to offset. But this wouldn't be good enough, because this would mean that we would only be logging the latest read. And we want to be able to check for races against any prior read that happened before the last barrier. So what we do is we wrap it in an if star. 
So the theorem prover, the, the verifier, should consider that the program does log this read or that it just continues to log whatever it was logging, if anything. All right? So yes, yeah, star is an expression that evaluates non-deterministically. So we either log this read, in which case read has occurred A and read offset A are overwritten, or we leave them alone, in which case they do whatever they were already doing. And log write is exactly the same. Now check read is very simple. We just assert that if a write has occurred to A by the other thread, then the offset written to by the other thread must not be the same as this offset that I'm checking. And that's all we have to do. And yeah, this is what I just said. And check, re check write is slightly more sophisticated because a write can race with either a write or a read. So we check that if a write has occurred, then the offset written to must be different from the offset that I'm writing. And if a read has occurred, the offset read from must be different from the offset that I'm writing. OK. And then finally, we have a precondition on the whole kernel saying that there initially is no read and no write on the array A. And we do this for every array. In principle, we could, we could um, just have a single Boolean and a single offset. And we could store for a read which array it was from, which offset. Okay. Uh, and that's actually what I tried first, and Shaz suggested splitting it up into multiple arrays because I think this was given the, the theorem proof at a really hard time. And also, it means that when you have, well, if you know about theorem proving based verification, you have these modified sets for loops. And it means that if a loop does a read, that read is going to kill this logging stuff for every array in the kernel. And you have to have an invariant recovering where reads could have happened for you know, all the arrays, even if they weren't touched by that loop. So splitting things up here has some advantages. And then barrier is quite nice to implement. Well, the first way I thought about doing it was that barrier should set read as occurred and write as occurred to false by assigning to them. And then I realized that this was really inconvenient because you might have a loop that does not read or write a particular array, but it's got a barrier in it. And then because we were assigning to these variables, they were in the loop modify set. And then we had to have invariants saying that you know, they've got the same value they had before. And, uh, or, uh, yeah, we, we had to have invariance about these variables. Whereas if we just assume that they are false, this does the trick. Okay, so the intuition behind this is that if you remember the, the instrumentation, there was always an, a possible non-determinative choice not to track a read, not to track a write. So there's always one path that's very lazy. It doesn't do anything. It just goes, no, 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 no. And then there's this tree of other paths that do track some reads and some writes against each other. And they're the important paths that actually find data races. But when you hit a barrier, you basically say, assume that we did the lazy thing. So all the paths that did track reads and writes, they get snipped. And we only have this path. And then we can do race logging and checking refresh from there. OK, any questions about this? I mean, it's, a, it's kind of low level, but I find it quite interesting. I find this assume business quite interesting. Yeah? Well, this analysis, um, so if you have a single thread which have a read and a write in, yeah. in the same thread, mm -hmm. and each thread is read and write to a different half set, yeah. will this analysis say there is a data race inside a thread? Um, Even if it's sequential. Um, you mean like, so we have an array A? And we do something like a read, so x equals a of some offset. On a separate ID of tid, say. Yeah. And then a write, did you say? Like a tid equals, equals x plus one, for example? Yes. Yeah. So, so will this be considered as a data race? Or? Um, n no, because there is no race checking performed within a thread. So it's, we're not going to check. Like, say, thread 6. We're not going to check, does thread 6's read conflict with thread 6's write? Mm -hmm. but, but for thread 9, we will consider, does thread 6's read conflict, conflict with thread 9's write? But they won't conflict because they use TID, which is different for every thread. OK. Uh, um, but as I see the transformation you showed before, yeah. so the first one will generate a read so we do like log read, TID1, yeah? And check read, TID2. That's what we would generate, oh, basically. Oh, it checks, okay, I see. And then we would it do log, 
right tid one check right two, um, two. yeah when you log right tid oh you you never check tid one no we only have a check tid two yeah so the the first thread is the logger and the second thread is the checker so what basically we're going to consider that log read and that check write we will consider we will look for conflicts between those and for conflicts between those uh yeah, yeah, that, that case, right. And actually that case there, we'll check for a right, conflicting with the right. But in both cases, you can see it's TID1 and TID2, which will be different. Okay. Yeah. So, you good question. You detect the race between different... Uh, between different tid. threads, that's right. Yeah. Okay, now let me tell you uh, how we handle loops and conditionals. So, we use predicated execution. The idea here is that we flatten the kernel so that all threads execute the same sequence of statements. We more or less eliminate any conditional code. We can't eliminate loops, though, so we have to do something a little bit sophisticated for loops. So let me explain, first of all, independently from GPU kernels, how predicated execution works. Just consider this snippet of code. If x is less than 100, increment x, otherwise increment y. We can make this predicated by introducing two fresh Booleans, p and q. And we can say that p is assigned to the Boolean x less than 100 and q assigned to the negation of that, not x less than 100. And then we can have, um, if this program is being executed, then both of these statements will be executed, but in predicated form. So we will say that x becomes equal to x plus 1 if p holds. Otherwise, it just gets assigned back to x. So effectively, this is a no-op if p is false. And then we can execute this statement. So y gets assigned y plus 1 if q is true. Otherwise, it gets reassigned y. OK, so this is uh, something that has been used, uh, it's used sometimes in compilers. If you have got, say, a processor where branches are quite expensive, you might have a little bit of conditional code, like a, a simple if then else, but you don't have many statements in e either the then branch or the else branch. It might be more efficient to flatten the whole thing using predicates um, than to actually have a branch and invoke the expense so of that. For example, just to uh, a question about this compiler thing that you're talking about. How would a compiler translate p question mark x plus one colon x? It would use. Does that introduce a branch? It, well, it would use a special instruction, a special select instruction. Oh, I yeah. See. So this would only work if the architecture supported that kind of instruction. Okay. It's a very common thing to do. In, to if you want to vectorize code automatically, you first can eliminate these conditionals, and then vector architectures tend to have a select operation that can oh. crunch through things like this. So you make a, like a, a vector of booleans, and then you've got a vector select that takes a vector of booleans and then a vector of then values and a vector of else values. Yeah. But it doesn't work if you've got really deeply nested stuff, because if you flatten it all, then you've got selects with selects with selects with selects with selects inside them. But that's fine for a theorem prover. OK. So what we do is we apply predication so that every execution point, there's a predicate determining whether each of the two threads is enabled. And then we parameterize the log and check procedures with a predicate recording whether the threads are actually actually logging or actually checking, or really they're not supposed to be there because they didn't get into that part of the code. So yeah, like x becomes equal to e, we turn now into, for each of the threads, um, this is if we've got a predicate p, this, uh, we're translating with respect to a predicate p, we, we do the, the select thing. So we say, for the first thread, x gets e dollar one, by which I mean the expression e dollarized, so I'm going to take all the local variables and turn them into the, to their dollar one form. Okay, uh, so if p holds, then e1, otherwise x gets left alone. And then an array read becomes, we log the read for thread one, but now we pass in p1 to, to record whether p was really alive or not. And the, the same for checking for thread two. And we do the havoking, but now the havoking has to become predicated. So we don't necessarily havoc x. We only havoc x if we are enabled. So we now have to do something like x1 becomes equal to if p then arbitrary, otherwise x1. In fact, like we, we have to do something a bit uh, different from that in boogie, because you can't have star in boogie. And a write is almost the same as before, but we pass in these predicates. All right, now I think I have some slides about loops. Uh, coming up. Yeah, the, the if then else is where the predicates come from. So if we've got if e do s, otherwise do t, what we do is we introduce um, a, pr a new predicate q. So p is our current predicate. So we say q for thread one is p for thread one and e1. So we take the existing predicate and we strengthen it with the conditional. And then we have another predicate r, which is 
the incoming predicate strengthened with the negation of the conditional. And in case you were wondering before, by the way, why I didn't, why I had P and Q, I didn't just use P and not P, maybe this will, if you were thinking that, maybe this will answer your thought, um, because Q and R are not going to be necessarily in the negation of one another, because they're both, they both involve P. All right. That's a, a subtlety. Okay, uh, and then we translate the then side with respect to Q, and then we translate the else side with respect to R. Okay. And then the loop cases, I think, is the most interesting. What we do here is we, we can't eliminate the loop, right? But what we do is we force both threads to keep executing the loop until they're both done with the loop. So if neither of them want to enter the loop, we, you skip the loop. But if one of them wants to enter the loop and one doesn't, they both enter the loop and they both execute the loop. But the one that didn't really want to go in the loop just does nothing until that first thread is finished and then they both leave. Okay, so we turn this into the following. We evaluate the loop guard into a predicate Q. So it's the loop guard strengthened by the incoming predicate. And then we loop while either Q1 is true or Q2 is true. So we loop while at least one of the threads is enabled. We translate the body of the loop with respect to Q. So this means that a thread, when we translate S, the body with Q, this will make sure that if a thread was not enabled, if its Q was false, it won't do anything. And then we uh, we update Q. So we say that Q becomes its old value strengthened by the loop guard, which may have changed, probably will have changed, according to the loop body. Okay. Yeah, and so in general, you, you handle non-structured code, right? We like do, the yeah. The LLVM, uh, yeah, the SSA. Uh, that's right, uh, and uh, that's what our ESOP paper was about. Okay. That was actually, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges of this project. So we had all this figured out, more or less, when I was at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And then we started to build a front end based on Clang's AST at the structured level, because that was the easiest thing to do in our minds. And that worked okay, but it meant that we couldn't handle kernels that did switch statements or kernels with breaks and continues, or they, or they were hard to handle. So yeah, so we, we, we thought about the go-to level, but then we thought, how do we do this predicated execution at the unstructured program level? Because here it's very nice because of the hierarchical structure. You have a predicate and you can descend in and descend in. Um, anyway, Shaz had a very smart idea and we worked out the details in. I don't understand the purpose of this, this predication, because a lot of it seems like what Boogie would already do for verification generation. Um, so is, is, is it because of the loops that, that you have to introduce this explicitly, that you can't just let Boogie? Uh... What, what we're trying to do is just, so we're trying to give Boogie a program whose correctness implies race freedom of the GPU kernel. And this, at the moment, we're just trying to construct that program. Once we have that program, Boogie then has to do its usual thing on the program. It has to do verification condition generation. You argued previously that we could just run thread one followed by thread two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, and that was going to be our schedule. In fact, you have sort of... Oh, well, I told you that you could do that schedule, or as mentioned, you could do a round robin schedule where you run like thread one mixes step, thread two mixes step, thread one mixes step, thread two mixes step. He's actually encoding that one. Right, so the question is, why in fact do you not just do the schedule where thread one executes all the way to the barrier and then yeah. thread two? And I think the answer is what he said, which is that it's the loops, because you want to get a joint invariant for those two threads mm. at the loop heads, right? Well, I would say it's like uh, m more fundamental than that, but like forget invariants for a minute, how do you even write down that program the where Say you've got say you've got a barrier in a loop, for instance, and um, well, I think you want to right. run. If you, did, I, I would argue that if you did not have any loops in the program, right? Yeah. It was a straight line code. Then what you could do is you could just replicate the code from one barrier to another twice. One for tid one, one for tid two. What if the barrier is nested inside conditionals? Well, so oh, I see. if you have no conditionals, then yes, you can do exactly that replication thing. If you've got conditionals, like a nest of conditionals with barriers here and barriers there, how do you get these barrier regions, barrier yeah. to barrier regions? It's, it it right. becomes tricky. And also, what do you do if you've got procedures and you go, you've got like some code, you go in a procedure, then there's a barrier. Then you have to basically expand everything. And I know I said we do do fill in lining currently, but we don't want to be limited to that. We would like to be able to do a modular analysis. Is that your question, Chris? Yeah, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I guess if, if you know where the barriers are and you can go from one barrier to the next. Yeah, okay, so yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, I think it's a really good question. And that was actually what I very first thought of. But the problem I found was that this notion of going from one barrier to the next becomes quite complicated with conditionals. The next barrier might be the same barrier having gone round 
two iterations of a nested loop or something. So I couldn't work out how you could write out this, this program without starting to expand all the possibilities. You know, you might be able to kind of expand all the possible resolutions of the conditionals, but then I think the program would grow very large yeah. to consider all the cases. Yeah. yeah. Well, or at least you'd have to consider all the barrier to barrier paths, yeah. essentially, yeah. which is quadratic, I guess. Uh, and this is linear, linear right? Quadratic. This is linear, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and but I think that the thing that this brings, which we, I hope, I hope people will write more complex GPU kernels in future, thus verification will become important, more important, and thus modular verification will become important. And then I think a strength of this predicated approach is it means that actually both threads appear to be stepping into a procedure at the same time, and then you really can verify procedures in isolation and use specifications. Right. So what's the translation? Okay, so you haven't shown us the predicated barrier yeah, that, so that's the, the yeah, let me show yet. you. Okay. So we haven't seen enough slides. Yeah, so, no. not quite. So I'm running over time a bit now, so I'll go in a few more minutes. And it's, it's all right, I, because there were lots of questions in the middle. You can continue up to level 45. Okay. If you need to go, I won't be offended. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, barrier, we turn into barrier, giving it both the predicates. Predicate one, predicate two. Yeah. All right. And now... So the log read and log write, they get modified in the obvious way. So we now have an enabled parameter that says, is a thread enabled? And now, if a thread's not enabled, we do not log its access. But if it is enabled, we may log its access. So this is like before, but just with this predication. OK, and yeah, the same for uh, the, the checks are predicated. So check write says, if I'm enabled, if I'm disabled, there's nothing to check. I'm not really here. I'm not really going to race. But if I'm enabled, then do the usual check. Okay, but now that barrier operation was just this assertion that said uh, we haven't logged yeah. anything. Mm. Right. So now, oh, sorry. So let me show you. Yeah. So the barrier takes these enabled parameters. Mm. Now this is how we check barrier divergence and actually predicated execution. Actually, that's why we first did predicated execution. We wanted a way to check barrier divergence. Do you remember we were, like talked to all these people about well, what is this barrier divergence problem? We finally nailed it down and. That was the initial source of predicate, predicated execution. But then it had various other benefits, which I now think of. Is barrier divergence mean the two threads wind up at different barrier instructions? It, it, so it's slightly more subtle than that. If they wind up at different barrier instructions, that is barrier divergence. However, if they get to the same barrier, but they've executed different numbers of loop iterations, that's barrier divergence. So for instance, if you've got an outer loop and an inner loop and a barrier inside the inner loop, it's not permissible for one thread to, go, to, to basically go outer loop in a loop, 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 and the other thread to go out a loop, out a loop, out a loop, out a loop, in a loop, in a loop, you know, and hit the barrier the same number of times. That's no good. They actually have to take the same paths through the loops. Is that, is that part of the OpenCL? Part of the OpenCL spec, okay. yeah. And the reason for it is that um, it's very difficult to actually compile a barrier operation in the way you could, in, in something like OpenMP uh, or MPI, you can have processes hit different barriers, and you can implement barrier synchronization that way. In a GPU kernel, it would be very difficult to do that due to the, the way these, these threads actually work. So the way we implement barrier is we assert that the threads are uniformly enabled. Either they're both disabled or they're both enabled. But if one is enabled and the other is disabled, this means that they've reached the barrier. They've either reached diff either one of them is, it basically means one of them is not there, either because he would be going to a different barrier or not going to any barrier ever, or would be, say, in a, like, out of sync with respect to the loops they're executing. So this precisely captures the requirements for barrier divergence checking. If I, I mean, I've, I sometimes give talks where I really explain that carefully with some examples, which I haven't done here. And then if, if the first thread's not enabled, if either of them is not enabled, because they, then they're both not enabled, so we return, because the barrier has not really been hit. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise, we do the assumed thing as before. You want to say if not enabled one or, oh, I see, because enabled one is equal to enabled yeah. one already. Okay, okay. Might be clear. Yeah. It might be clearer not to do that optimization, but. Yeah. Okay. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, I don't understand the definition of barrier divergence for non structured code, but we could <laughs> take that one off. Right? Okay, yeah. All right, well, that, I mean, now I just had a slide here where if there was time, I would talk about some of these things. I don't have slides on them. Um, so the, like the, we spent a lot of time working on invariant inference, which I find very interesting. We use Houdini to do that. And 
And now what I'm working on, and I'm, I've been talking to Akash Lal quite a bit about this, is some ideas for trying to optimize Houdini to be a bit smarter in how it considers candidates. And for GPU Verify, my ideas work really well. That's where they came from. And Akash gave me some obfuscated boogie programs. Uh, and they, my ideas don't work well on them. For, and I'm hoping to talk to Shaz about that over this next couple of days. So yeah, there were a lot of really interesting practical issues in building on the Elobelm compiler framework. The principal one was this predicated execution for unstructured control flow graphs. That was very challenging and interesting. And then doing source level error reporting actually was very interesting because um, these, we don't report some assertion might fail. We actually want to report, there might be a data trace between a pair of statements. And the problem we have is that what, for one of the statements, things are fine. That's the statement that was reached second. And then there is an actual statement. We know that that statement is the potential culprit. But then that statement will be interfering with something that may be another statement, or it may be something that came from abstracting a loop or abstracting a procedure. And what we want to say to the user is we want to give them a best effort guess at the program statement that caused that problem. So what we actually do is we carry source location information around in loop invariants. So we, with a, with a read or a write, we log the offset. We also log the line number. And then we have loop invariants that say things like, if there's a read, it's from an offset satisfying this pattern, and it's from one of those line numbers. Right? Seriously, I know it sounds crazy, but uh, and that means that when we get a model from Z3, we can ask which line number the, the, the first error came from, and that allows us to give a, a potential error. I mean, but I thought that the way you have encoded the read or the write logging is using this non-deterministic choice. Yeah. So just following that control information about which branch was taken, wouldn't that give you? No, because say you've got a read that's inside a loop, then having the loop modified variables can just set, can just say a read did occur and it occurred from location 5 billion. Uh, and that, that may just be a false positive or maybe that there is a write in the loop that could write to some, to write that location. So what we have to do is additionally, well, what we do, we don't have to do this. In fact, Matthew Parkinson, I talked to him and he came up with a smarter idea. Um, but what we do currently is we actually carry around source location information in those tracking variables. And then we have like, the source line. And then we have um, a global invariant saying that the source location variables can only be one of the possible locations they could be. And then we have more smarter invariants to try to infer bounds on those line numbers. Matthew's idea is smarter, right? Basically, you know a certain check failed. You know, so you know immediately which erase the problem. So now what you can do is you can eliminate all of, the other, all of the other checks, and you can eliminate all the logs on other arrays. Now you've got a bunch of logs on the array in question. Split them into two sets. Disable them, half of them here, half of them there, and run the verifier on both. At least one will fail. As soon as one fails, kill the other one. Now divide those into two and keep going. You basically binary search until one log remains and one check remains. Uh, and that would avoid all this invariant stuff. Because it's very expensive to carry this stuff around in invariants. Cool. <laughs> I guess cool. it, it's Delta debugging. Is it Delta debugging? Yeah, more or less. I mean, yeah. you're, you're sort of saying, take, take, take away, uh, you know, keep taking away sources. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. A anyway, so. But it's actually quite hard to implement there might that. Be, yeah, there might be a better way to do that. I don't, I don't know. But um, <laughs> yeah, so yeah. can you say, um, you know, out of the, the various sources of imprecision, now, what's most commonly you know, the reason why you fail to prove race freedom? Is it because you sort of have looked all the reads from the arrays? Yes, yeah, not having a strong enough loop invariant and saying so, that. OK, so it's, OK, so is it because your abstraction allowed a loop invariant that would prove it? Or is it because by abstracting so much, you know, by turning all the reads of the arrays into habits, yeah. You know, you just you lost all possibility. Of it's almost always. Th there are some examples where our upfront abstraction makes it actually impossible to verify the kernel, yeah. no matter what invariants we then got. Right. But that's, um, and, we, uh, and there's an important class of kernels, which we have a paper under review about dealing with using this barrier invariance technique for more precise abstractions. Yeah. But in the, for the most part, kernels don't fall into that category. And those kernels, it really comes down to finding loop invariants that characterize the access patterns of um, of arrays, I see. I see. Okay. and we have a template-based approach for doing that. And template-based approaches have advantages, but their main disadvantage is that 
if the access pattern falls outside the template or is obscured by, by syntax that, yeah. you know, uh, then, then, we, right. then we die. It's, it's often because you have accesses, you know, at a certain stride or something like that. Yeah, a certain stride or, may, or maybe, yeah. I mean, I can show you some examples. Okay. We have, yeah, we have a bunch of cases. And so the things I would like to explore are be more aggressive with the invariant inference and using this technique that I alluded to about optimizing Houdini to make Houdini um, be able to take larger candidate sets because yeah. the more candidates, the more chance you have. Right. Second thing is we're looking at a daikon-like technique for actually doing some dynamic invariant generation right. to give Houdini candidates. That's probably how we're going to try it. And the third thing, well, we have a grant funded in which we said we would explore interpolation. So but so. dynamic, you just mean you will do a simulation, right? Yeah, actually simulate you the... Can't we instrument, you said you can't instrument these GPUs, uh, right? Yeah, we either, we, either, we either run the boogie program, if that's possible. Okay. Uh, using the, this is tool, I can't remember the name, but someone has written a boogie In interpreter. ETH. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So we might use that. Or we might work on an interpreter for LLVM bitcode so that we can run our kernels. And there's this Klee CL tool at Imperial that does dynamic symbolic execution of OpenCL kernels. The, pro the, the main problem is once we find these invariants, these likely invariants, how do we map them back to the actual boogie variables? That's the kind of practical problem. Yeah. That can, and that can be really tricky if you're dealing with, problem. yeah. I have a better suggestion, which is actually to do that on the, on the logic, on the verification conditions rather than the boogie. But, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, the, the, but the problem with, but the daikon style approach is also a template-based approach. It has the potential to find things that are syntactically obfuscated but occur dynamically, so you can see that they happen. But still, you have to have your predefined things you're looking for. So I really, like, despite having seen a number of talks about interpolation, I don't get the general thing, but my understanding is that with interpolation, you may be able to discover things that are problem-specific. Well, you might, but I, I was going to say, about, the other thing about Daikon is you can discover things that you can't actually prove. Yeah, that's true, right? Yeah, 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 that's yeah. Because yeah. say they rely on some nonlinear. Okay, so or something. so yeah. we're really trying to actually push this technique to people in industry, and I th I really think that probably they're more interested in bug finding and such like. So we might use the daikon thing to take invariants and trust them. You know, just as a I mean, sort of thing that you know, your CAV reviewers will but cry if they hear you say that. But. Roll the damn thing. Would you find enough bugs? That you, so there's an, another problem. So often you have a loop that's going to do an extortionately large number of iterations, and it's correct. Until you and then you have another loop, loop that's bad, and you're never going to get past that with unwinding. So you may be able to get a hint at a problem by a failed proof attempt. And I have some ideas about trying to trying to under approximate loops. Yeah. yeah. Acceleration. yeah. yeah. So there's a nice paper by Georg Reisenbach and others at CAV about loop. Well, it's not loop acceleration. It's loop under approximation, which... Under, something like under approximate acceleration. Yeah. So I had a look at that and I think like, so that was formalizing some, some things I've been thinking about. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. See, which is why it would be cool to have that built in at a lower level, right? So, oh, so, yeah. what, so that other people could benefit from it. So that everybody could benefit from yeah, such a level. That's right. exactly. yeah. yeah, I think that there are many advantages to what you're proposing. Because if nobody is really interested in all these templates and invariants, that the lowest level that you can do it, the less engineering you would have to do. The further and you can push it, the more people can use it. Exactly. So, so like, I said, my plan for practical deployment of GPU Verify is as follows. There are three versions of the tool. There's one version which is eager to find bugs, one version that's eager to verify, and one version that's neutral. So by eager to find bugs, I mean you do like unrolling, for instance. By eager to verify, I mean, for instance, you turn off race checking but keep on race logging so that you can quickly find your best invariant with Houdini without the expense of actually performing the race check. And once you find the best invariant, you then see if it's good enough to do the race check. And then in the middle, you've got the one that just does everything at once and it may, it may quickly discover that a proof won't work, but doesn't find a bug. So the idea is if the bug finder finds a problem, you kill the others and say there's a problem. If the verifier proves things, you say good. And um, if either of the two verifier approaches fail, you just ignore that. And after 90 seconds, you say no problems were found. So that's my kind of, that's my, the way I envisage people getting use from the tool. I don't really think it's going to be very useful if, this is, I mean, despite our efforts with invariant inference, there's a, a very high chance that the tool will report false positives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, actually, should, should talk, you should do about this kind of stuff, about you know, trying to take uh, in, incomplete proofs and, and sort of use those as a way of, uh, if you will, triaging the error reports and yeah. deciding which ones are most likely to be, to be real error reports. Also, the thing that you're doing with joint um, 
invariance for the two threads for loops yeah. is actually, a, it seems pretty closely related to his differential assertion checking. Really? So, okay. Yeah, because he's essentially doing that as well. He has a construction that's essentially giving you, a, you know, boogie to boogie translation that's essentially giving you joint invariance for, for loops. And the for the, okay, so you've got two, like, two programs he, and it's like you're considering them in step versions, or something. Say two versions of mm -hmm. the same program. I see, right, right. And what he wants to know is sort of to say one is safer than the other. You know, the one, if one, if the second version, if the uh, second version crashes on a given input, then the first version crashes on that, on that input. Uh, so that's what he means by differential assertion checking. Yeah. And so, but in practice, what that means is you're looking for joint invariance for the loop. So it's like running you know, the, the, the loops in the two versions and, and okay. block stuff. And it, it, it may give something some yeah, yeah. ultimate. Okay, I'll definitely talk to him about that. Okay, thanks for listening. Thank you. All right. Okay. Standard speaker.